is completely altering the ecology of that site and the flyway. And there are so many great examples of this industrial doom loop, this positive feedback. Thermal comfort in energy is the most notable in that if we can't provide comfort right outside our homes and our businesses, people flee indoors and just crank open the, the air conditioner. And so you're generating heat on site, you're generating heat along the transmission lines, and you're generating heat at the energy generation source, which increases the heat overall, which increases the amount of people fleeing indoors, which increases the amount of industrial energy needed to power those air conditioners. Food production is another great um, feedback loop where we produce just incredible amount of cheap calories low in nutritional value. And as a consequence, humans are getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, because we're not really getting our nutritional needs met. And as a consequence of this, we've overrun the Sacramento, San Joaquin, uh, Coachella and Imperial Valleys with agriculture. And even personal health um, is a industrial doom loop. Uh, Advil is a great example. If we take too much Advil, you could get edema hypertension, diarrhea, constipation, or um, high blood pressure. And so you would remediate any of these by going back to Walgreens or CVS to get the medicine. So Advil sends you down a path of needing more and more industrial uh, medicines. And, and we can stop this. We know the remedy, and this is an old remedy, half earth. The surest way to slow or stop species loss and climate change is to set aside half the planet for native and natural endeavors. One half of the earth is dedicated to human needs. The other half is dedicated to human needs. And the only way this idea will work is if urban areas start shouldering the needs of its consumptive members. Urbanites need to stop overrunning distant landscapes and start creating richer and deeper connections to our own. I might add it's half earth that has inspired Biden's and Newsom's 30-30 plan. 30% 30 of open space is designated as permanent open space. And this is a, a measure to reach this goal of half earth. So the message of this presentation, the thesis of this presentation is caring for us cares for all. We create relationships with urban landscapes. We encourage and participate in reciprocal landscapes that nurture an urban land ethic that supports resilience, persistence, and replication. We graciously show up to give and receive. And this is a harvest meal at the Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona. And we end most of our classes by going into the land and receiving the bounty that we have earned after 17 weeks of hard work. So what I'll be talking about today are the things that we can capture, grow, and harvest from urban areas. So I'll be looking at thermal comfort, energy, food, craft and textiles, ceremonial items, landscape materials, and self-care. So I'm just gonna take a deep breath. Because here I got to kind of roar to leave enough time for questions. So number one, thermal comfort. We need to cool our urban areas. And the five strategies are well, under, uh, well understood. We know them. And these strategies are ranked according to effectiveness per dollar spent. So number one is shading. Just provide as much shade as we can to our urban areas. Increase the amount of airflow. Get that cooling effect working. Increase the amount of evaporative processes, whether that's small water features, aerosoling water, or just more vegetation. Work with materials that are light colored and low density, so they don't store that solar radiation as heat. And then earth cooling, which is the most expensive, but one of the most effective. This is a great example. This is the Audubon Center in Debs Park in downtown Los Angeles. It is the first LEED certified building in the United States. Those two structures don't have any air conditioners. They rely on this corridor for their thermal comfort. So this has been, those buildings have been orientated towards the south. They welcome the ocean breeze to come in 
They compress the breeze, speed it up, and run it over two small ponds and under a canopy of wild grape. That breeze then goes into the buildings and it's constantly cooling the air. Strategies like this can drop urban temperatures by as much as nine degrees without any industrial energy. These strategies work. Energy. Prior to fossil fuels, all of us had intimate relations with energy. It's time to rekindle some of those relationships. We can rekindle relationships with biofuels, earth energies, human, solar, and wind energies. Pictures are two examples of bioenergies. So at the Lyle Center, we grow wood just for firewood for our pizza oven, an incredible contraption for community development and community enhancement. And then these on the picture to the right are the snags left over from the Dixie fire. Well, this was the largest fire in the state of California in 2021. And here they're reducing future fire risk and generating electricity and powering local homes. So there's a lot of ways to use biofuels. Wind energy is probably the least understood energy in urban areas, but wind has two great impacts. First, it cools, and second, it improves the air quality. So if you live in Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, Stockton, air quality is a massive concern, and just allowing the air to run through urban areas um, picks up those ultra-fine particulates and jettisons, jettisons them above our mouth. The air is just cleaner. This is a good example. This is Cal Poly Pomona, which is notoriously warm. And here they just orientated this um, structure um, southwest to get that summer breeze, funnel it through the courtyard, and then fill it with um, evaporative processes. And it does a magnificent job of cooling that outdoor living area. And there, and here you have an illustration showing how to welcome wind on a property and making sure that it flows just right on to you through and to your neighbor's property. Working wind, with wind is really important. And then solar panels, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but solar panels are toxic to mine, they're toxic to make, and they're toxic to dispose of. In fact, they're just toxic. And harvesting solar energies without those toxins should be a mandate. So cooking with solar energy, daylighting, drying, and thermal converters. Here, this is a small office that's being lit by a solar tube. No need for industrial energies during the day. This is a neighbor's uh, clothes drying rack that she's so proud of. And then this is the Humboldt Wildlife Refuge where the rangers use thermal converters for all their hot water needs. And then earth energies are fantastic, but they are expensive. That's why we just don't see them. But embedding a structure or an outdoor living environment into the earth harvests that cool coolness of the soil below, typically um, soils four feet below or range in the 50s. And so if you can put a building into those 50 degrees, you really regulate indoor temperatures. So to the left is Rogers Gardens in Corona Del Mar. And all they did was mound soil outside of their retail building here, and it dramatically cools that structure. And then this is a classroom at the Lyle Center. Now this is the second coolest classroom, it really doesn't need air conditioning. And that's because the back of the classroom has been embedded into the hill and it does an incredible job of helping regulate indoor temperatures. Human energy, while our output isn't so dramatic, our impact is. Simple things we can do, everyday things we can do to reduce the use of industrial energies. Um, everything from pushing a lawnmower to weed whacking. <laughs> and just to give you a gauge on uh, how puny our energy is, if I put any of you on a bicycle that generated electricity, um, at most you could probably generate about 100 watts per hour, um, which is enough for two or three light bulbs. Um, and um, a couple phones and your personal computer. And then food. Typically, urban food is energy drenched. Active urban food production is rarely more energy efficient than industrial agriculture. We lack the economies of scale. Industrial agriculture typically produces food with a um, 
E-R-O-E-I, return on investments of a six to one. So one unit of digestible energy for six units of industrial energy in, but urban food production actually runs about one to 10. And so it's really more energy drenched and more carbon drenched. And you can see it in this picture, uh, micro irrigation, all kinds of accessories, uh, wire, stakes, umbrellas, all this needs to be added into your food production. I, I, I want to add um, that these gardens are incredible at community engagement um, and public health and well-being. So I'm not discounting the role that they have in urban areas. I'm just saying that if we're really going to feed 39 million Californians, we really need to do it at scale. But in urban areas, though, Passive and spontaneous food should rule. So passive food is when the food does something other than just food production. So we can be growing food that cools our communities, that increases the amount of habitat that we have, or generates materials, or reduces oxides or particulates, or sequesters carbon. And here's some good examples. Up at the Lyle Center, we grow a lot of stone fruits. And a year has passed, one third of all those um, blooming branches would be cut for cut flowers. And we found that the students, the cut flowers actually resonate with the students a little more. They're really eager to take them home and share them. And they were so bubbly uh, with that gift um, that it just turned out that stone fruits were just as good for food production as they were for cut flowers. Um, Food has been saving Californians from wildfires for hundreds of years. Their record is impeccable, um, some types of food. And what's neat about using food for fire protection is it creates a clean line, a clean distinction between the areas where fire is beneficial and wanted and the areas where fire is detrimental and unwanted. It creates a very fine line. This is in Yorba Linda and this um, citrus Grove of citrus trees just absolutely stopped this wildfire. And then the picture above is just an inner city garden with one avocado tree. And you can see the incredible shade um, that this tree is providing this um, early 1900s home. Um, but the tree does more than just provide shade. It provides heavy nutrition, dollars fall from the sky. Um, the tree gulps nitrogen and carbon oxide, so it cleans the air. It produces no allergens, so it's good for any segment of the population. And any kid can climb the tree without risk of being stabbed or poked or, or, or prodded. So it's just a wonderful urban inner city um, asset. And then spontaneous foods. I know most of you think these um, spontaneous foods, which are weeds, are uh, the villain, but really so many of these weeds are edible. They're not only edible, but they're superfoods. So many weeds can be found in your health food store. Stinging nettle and cleavers. Um, I could just go on about that. In fact, this one slide I can spend the next four hours on. But here's just some of the foods that I harvest through my neighborhood. Carob, which comes from a tree. Um, it's non-native and just um, is spontaneous. It creates a, a seed pod that is just absolutely delicious. It's a chocolate substitute and it's loaded with sugars, proteins, and fibers. In fact, it's a colon for your scrub brush. Um, when I biked down the coast of California, th these greens right here were the greens that uh, were my anti-inflammatories that kept my body in line to be able to do those heavy miles. So curly dog, shepherd's purse, dandelion, fillery, plantain, and sow thistle were abundant and really helped push me down the coast. And then this is just a common soup that I have every winter. Um, cheeseweed, stinging nettle, wild lettuce topped with any mustard flour. In fact, I had a wild lettuce and fennel soup for lunch today. But spontaneous foods are free, abundant, and incredibly healthful. And then craft and textiles. We could be actually growing a lot of our textiles in urban areas. Pictured is um, the Fiber Shed uh, organization in the Point Ray Station. And what's pictured is cotton and a wool sweater. And these were all these fibers were grown in Marin and Sonoma County, along with the indigo blue here that was grown in Point Ray Station. Um, it's just a wonderful grassroots effort that they're doing up there. 
but there's other fires. These are um, from come from the Marin Art and Garden Center. They were crafted by an individual named uh, Charlie Kincard, Kennard, and he is just a uh, just a, a journeyman when it comes to working with fibers. And here we have a broom that's actually made out of Scotch broom, the notorious weed in, in Marin County, and then a beehive that is full of bees made out of um, reeds, rushes, and grasses. And then we have a willow basket uh, right next door. If you've never been to that um, fiber garden at the Marin Art and Garden Center in Ross, it is dynamite, just wonderful. Uh, here's some other things that we could be crafting in dense downtown areas. Um, here we have a willow ornamentation backed by a bamboo fence. This is a yucca leaf uh, necklace that I crafted. And then every winter I uh, spend the rainy days creating twine from local materials. And then I'll use them throughout the years for gifts and wrappings. So we have a rundo dandelion, a royal willow bast, Mexican fan palm, uh, Spanish bayonet leaves. And then my favorite, the lower left, is um, narrow leaf milkweed. And it makes a luxurious fiber that's silver, it's sheeny, and um, it's really strong. Um, and it's, it's like linen. It would have been the linen of indigenous fibers. Um, and then dyes. Dyes are just so much fun. I love giving dyes um, as a gift to my family and friends. So if somebody's having a child, I will dye uh, their baby towels. If somebody moved into a new house, I'll dye up a whole bunch of um, kitchen towels, um, really anything. And some of the highlights here is that deep brown is red bud. Um, that royal purple is cochineal. Uh, these yellows, uh, that really sunny yellow is Chinese, tal Chinese tallow tree. Um, the leaves of Chinese tallow. There's also um, coyote brush tops, um, pine cones, eucalyptus, alder bark. Um, and this is all material that's within three miles of my house. And then ceremonial items. I often think that ceremonial items would be a better bet for urban areas than food production. And the reason being is it's so easy to grow. It doesn't attract the pests like food does. You're not going to have the vector issues like food, so no rats or parrots or raccoons. Um, it has excellent storability, unlike food, and it is always well-received, ceremonial items. And ceremonial um, events are so consumptive. If you look at Chinese New Year, Day of the Dead, Christmas, Easter, it's just single-use items, and then it's just thrown. Imagine growing that and composting it. So these, these events don't have a real impact on the environment. Pictured here are marigolds uh, being grown in downtown LA for Day of the Dead, Day of de los Muertos. And then we have Christmas trees absorbing the oxides from the five freeway in San Juan Capistrano. You can also grow, there's millions of examples in my book, actually, I give loads of examples, but these are placemats that I crafted from Mexican fan palms. So it was placemats and coasters for a dinner party I was hosting. And then a local neighbor of mine who works for a tree company salvages um, the materials from their work and repurposes it um, and then sells it in downtown Orange. So keeping items out of the waste stream and storing that carbon on site. And then landscape materials, my gosh, we don't, really need to buy too much landscape materials. The trick is designating 5% of your landscape to actually grow the items that your garden needs. We really don't need to buy the wood for raised beds or tomato cages. You can grow those. Uh, the poles for pole beans, you can grow those. It is so easy. We can get off the industrial cycle by growing so much of what we need. We can grow fertilizers, mulches, pest controls, propagals, screens, woody products, poles, planks, you name it. Um, this is just a border to keep people on the path at a botanical garden. And then here we have branches that were salvaged from a green waste of a tree coming down to make a beautiful um, meditative retreat. Some of the other items, um, this is, these two pictures come from Moonwater Farm in Compton. 
and there was a Diodorus cedar that just came down uh, their neighbors and so they repurposed it into a wash basin and a walkway and they're keeping the carbon on site and they're keeping it out of the industrial waste stream and then self-care oh this is so important self-care um, I hammer this with all my students. Self-care should always be within reach. Outside of every door, every window, every office should be something to care for your needs, whether that's bouquets, fragrances, or health remedies. I don't know if you know this, but um, dandelion flowers are an ancient cure for low-grade depression. So you just take five or six dandelion flowers, clean them up, just put them in a cup, Put boiling water over it, let it seep for 15 minutes and then drink up and you'll really feel better. It's got a small acid in there that um, just improves your health and well-being. And then loofahs, we really don't need to um, buy sponges. <laughs> we can grow our sponges. Loofahs grow throughout the state and they're ridiculously easy to grow and they're guilt-free. When you're done with a sponge, it just goes right into the compost pile. Um, so it's just one. This is an early loofah from last year of mine. Um, bouquets. Bouquets are wonderful. They don't create the vector problems that food does. They are really easy to grow and they can be so abundant. Pictured is Solano um, Community Farm uh, Gardens below Dodger Stadium in LA and they grow a cornucopia of food and cut flowers. And you can see they just love the flowers. And this is a gal from San Diego. She lives in a depressed neighborhood and she was able to care for some of her neighbor's front yards and grow cut flowers, which then she sells to farmer's markets and special events. And here again, she's reducing her carbon footprint. She's meeting a vital urban need and she's making a living. And then even having a fragrant rose and just a couple sprigs of spearmint on a desk will elevate a worker's mood and boost morale. And fragrances, you're probably well aware of the power of aromatherapy. It can soothe, it can arouse. Aromatherapy you can do a lot of things. And in these pictures here, this is a little contraption, a steam distillation. And what I'm doing is making a hydrosol out of camphor leaves. And camphor is a wonderful medicine for joint aches. So it's like Ben Gay. And I'm getting old and that becomes a lot more important. Uh, here I made um, pine pitch solve. So I just scrape the pine pitch off the trunks as it runs down. We love horticulture, a horta torture in Southern Cal. So there's so much pine pitch. And it is wonderful for expelling things from your skin. So bug bites, splinters. Um, I just use it as a cologne. I just figure everybody loves sitting next to a forest and I just use that as a cologne and then cleansing sticks. Cleansing sticks have been used for thousands of years to purify, to energize and to clean indoor spaces. And these are just some of the cleansing sticks I was able to harvest from the sidewalks around my home. So we have incense, cedar, bay, juniper, lavender, mugwort, um, Canary Island pine needles, rosemary, and then tea tree leaves. And by far my favorite was the incense cedar and the lavender. The incense cedar particularly, it just had this really woodsy um, fragrance that resonated with um, my personality. And then self-care, actual physical remedies. You can be growing so much of what you get at Walgreens and CVS. So whether it's constipation, like fennel is a quick fix for that, um, depression, dandelion flowers, um, elderberry flowers, digestion, ease of breathing, eucalyptus and bay, hypertension would be um, uh, Australian willow, low energy, low libido, chase tree if you have low libido, muscle and joint aches, pain relief, wild lettuce, um, rashes and more. And here's just some quick examples. Um, here I'm having a cup of uh, ginkgo tree leaves, tea. Sorry about that. Um, ginkgo can be found throughout the state and you harvest um, just before they turn colors late summer and it feels like a tailwind. It helps with circulation. It improves your memory because you have more oxygen in your head 
and it just makes you feel better. And it just is an energizer. And it's so common and easy to find. Here, this is prickly salt thistle. I made a cup of tea out of this. It's a mild painkiller and great for digestion. Uh, the leaves are edible, the stems are edible, the root is a good coffee substitute. And uh, the neat thing about the sow thistles is it also removes warts. So if you work with a lot of uh, animal composts, you're bound to get warts on your knuckles. This is your cure. I've used it many times. And then elderberry. I'm speaking to the choir here. I'm sure everybody's well aware of the benefits of elderberry. But the flowers make a tea that's a calming agent. Historically, indigenous women would have fed it to their children, um, especially when they were teething. Um, and then the flowers are high in sapins, which make a great fragrant body wash. Uh, the berries are antiviral, phenomenal for um, fevers and colds. And when eaten raw, they will clean out your digestive tract. <laughs> Added bonus. Um, and then the bottom right is um, cottonwood. And when you make a detoxin of the young sprigs of cottonwood, um, it is a powerful uh, muscle relaxant. So if I overworked my body in the garden or on the bike, I will um, have a, just a teaspoon of cottonwood and it just takes the rigidity out of my muscles and really soothes my body. Um, and I just... Creating connections with the land is incredible for your health, for public health. The data is exhausting. If we divided the whole U.S. population in half, gardeners and non-gardeners, gardeners live 14 years longer than non-gardeners. People... Not sure if Doug's frozen or if I'm frozen. All right, it looks like it might be that Doug has frozen. All right, we'll give him a moment here to come back around. We know that, among other things, there are probably power outages going all over the state right now. All right, we'll give him a moment to come back around. Um, and we'll, I saw some topics going around about, uh, various things about elderberries and different um, different pieces that he's been talking about. Oh, we've been, we've lost him entirely. We'll give him a moment to, to bring him back. Um, if not, I've got the rest of his presentation. We'll go ahead, we'll bring it up and we'll work from there as needed. I won't do nearly as good of a job. So we're gonna give him a moment to come back up. Um, as we're waiting on him, just checking, um, Checking on if anybody has any particular ones that they want to recommend to put into the, the chat. I know I grow and harvest a lot of my own tea um, with, uh, with mint, with uh, lemon balm. We do a lot of our own salads this time of year with Rura um, harvested throughout the areas. Um, so we've got a couple people putting good ones into the chat here. I will go ahead. We will find, let me find where he was in his talk and we'll go ahead and put it up for when he comes through. Oh, we've got somebody who's successfully growing chamomile for sleepy tea. I planted a bunch of chamomile this year and it didn't come up. I did, I didn't get it quite right. Elderberry to help prevent colds. Any concern with toxins from pollutions from urbist, urban harvesting? Um, we can talk about that some, got someone growing native sage using white sage as an herb in cooking, which is amazing. If you ever tried a brown butter sage sauce on things, uh, yerba buena in tea as well. We've got recommendations for that. Let me go ahead and pull up Doug's talk and we will give him, oops, that's not. We'll give him just a moment to do it from where, where it was at. There we go. And a moment here, see if it'll come through. I'm 
going to assume that he has lost power where he is since I'm not seeing him come through. All right. We're going to continue looking through this. Give it a moment. Um, ooh, somebody making yarrow salves. Good for antibacterial properties and for stopping bleeding. I had yarrow in a saison beer recently. Excellent. Very, very good. Um, and someone looking for recommendations for herbs for anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and we'll go ahead. We we'll, After this talk, we have it being recorded. It will send out a list of resources along with the link to the recording when it's done. And oops, that was not what was supposed to happen there. Hmm. Learning all the time. This part. So we'll send out a list of resources. And if you have resources that you can recommend and that we put in, we'll go ahead and include those as well. All right, we're going to go back to public health from the current slide and just take a look at next slide. So, okay, the conclusion part. Um, I think it's pretty obvious here. Regeneration is a relationship with the land. We've got someone in our office whose favorite saying is that the best thing that you can put on your garden is your shadow. The, it's the best way to know what's happening with your soil, what is happening with the health of your plants, what is happening with the irrigation of them, and knowing and putting yourself into the landscape on a regular basis is that relationship learning the the plants, the way the water flows. Um, and he's got a couple of recommendations here for John T. Lyle and for Robin Wall Kimmer. Kimmerer. And I will recommend also, um, if you haven't read or listened to Braiding Sweetgrass, it is excellent. It's also, she has an amazing reading voice if you enjoy books on tape version. Okay. So relationship with the land, it makes it so much more obvious that we are intertwined, that everything we do impacts the land and that it impacts us. And it makes it more obvious what we need um, from the land as well. And the other part is defining sustainability in, in your life. How would you define sustainability and how do you work with it? We have some questions on in the Q&A around pieces with this with heat. I'm, I would recommend, among other things, for looking at sustainability for these pieces. Um, I'm a huge fan of Brad Lancaster and what he does with his rainwater harvesting. He lives in Tucson, which is dry, arid, hot, open mostly, and has created a food forest in his landscape, in his neighborhood, by harvesting the water that comes onto or near the site and by using building the building levels to shade different things, to run water past different parts as they need it. Um, it's, he's a great resource. Listening to his talks or reading his books is a wonderful way to learn some of the pieces, both in water harvesting, but also in how it creates these forests to create these other pieces that Doug has been talking about. So looking at your needs and how can you meet them within your landscape, your community landscapes. Um, Doug had a couple of great examples of places that are teaching and training on some of those, but a lot of it is still available. And when we live in highly urbanized areas, it's easy to forget that we are so connected and ingrained and involved in our landscape that there is food there, that there's um, you know, ways to, to cool and to heat, not for everyone in every situation, but finding the ones that work for you and that fit are really important. All right, and the hardest part, um, urban landscapes are harder for these. Allowing urban landscapes to be part of our world in that way is, uh, is some work and it takes some effort and some thought and some consideration on it. And these are some of the books that Doug has written. Um, we've got, we've known of his work previously as a landscape architect. 
He's got ones on foraging. He's got the um, firescaping. I, when we use the term firescaping, Doug literally wrote the book on it. And the most recent one, this regenerative essential goods and services in urban landscapes. So I'm going to go ahead and come out of the slideshow and stop sharing. And then we'll we'll go into some of the Q&A for this. And I'm still hopeful that Doug will make it back in. But if not, um, you know, we'll have the rest of the discussion and we'll hope we'll have to catch up with him later. So in the Q&A, we've got two questions. Um, keep it, how would you keep termites from wood pieces in our yards? Um, that's a bigger question. I live in the middle of a forest in a wood house surrounded by woods. Part of that is I recognize that um, that they're, they are part of the ecosystem here. What I've had recommended is orange oils in our area are supposed to be really good for keeping them out of the wood pieces in the yards. Uh, and then we have another one that says, uh, Mr. Kent mentioned the effects of using systems such as air conditioners. Looking at the chat, the heat is unequivocally an issue. And we are, it's true, we are right in the middle of it. Um, what methods would be most economically sustainable to assist in attacking the issue in an area such as Boyle Heights, East LA, and urban areas alike? I don't know that one as well, and I'm going to defer on answering it for right now, and I'm going to try to find more resources and have that in our follow-up resources for this talk. All right. Somebody's mentioned in the notes that Doug used a lot of examples of non-native plants. Um, we do need to be fostering the native plants in our systems that are here, but uh, ones that aren't native, there are whole books on um, kind of eating away invasive plants, how to, how to get rid of them in positive ways. So there are ways to use the plants that are non-native or even potentially invasive. Um, okay, book titles. I will put back up his book slide and let me go ahead and share that. Your screen, book titles. Sure. All right, I'll put that back up. We will bring it all the way up to here. Um, and I know we've got people putting in recommendations on books, on locations, and even including links, which is terrific. Somebody included Brad, Brad Lancaster's link in there as well. So I appreciate you adding that in. And I'm sorry that we don't have Doug to finish the talk and help through the rest of this discussion, but we will follow up with the links, we'll follow up with the recording, and we'll try to find the answers for some of the things that have come up in the chat. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap a little bit early for tonight, but we just want to, I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, next month, we'll be talking a lot about smaller space gardens, um, how to care for, choose and care for um, ones that need to be in pots and containers. If you have smaller spaces, a small yard, a small, um, balcony type situation, or even if you're just a container plant person. So we'll have that next month on the first of the month. I appreciate you being here. Thank you all very much. Stop share and I will see you hopefully next month. Thanks.